Hi, I'm Jared Gardner. Today we're going to talk about tenosynovial giant cell tumors. Uh, these are two different uh, ends of the same spectrum. But on one end, you have a small localized form that's more commonly known as giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. And that's what we're looking at right here. You can see all these uh, huge osteoclastic giant cells, some of which have numerous nuclei. And the other uh, tumor that's on this spectrum is pigmented villonodular synovitis. So giant cell tumor of tendon sheath and PVNS, pigmented villonodular synovitis, again, they're on a spectrum. At high power, they look essentially identical, but they are distinguished by their size and whether or not they're localized or more diffuse and infiltrative, and also their location, whether they're within the um, articular space or extra articular. Okay, so we're gonna walk through the different features of these things in this video to help you sort them out because these are relatively common tumors. And I think that when you see a case like this where you see giant cells everywhere, the first thing that comes to mind is they're giant cells, it must be giant cell tumor. And that's fine when the giant cells are present, but there are cases of giant cell tumor that do not have very many giant cells or have no giant cells. And so because of that, I always tell my trainees that they have to learn to recognize tenosynovial giant cell tumors without the giant cells. And so this video is going to talk about not just the giant cells, but all of the other features in the background that will help you make the diagnosis, okay? So let's go into those features here at higher power. You can see the giant cells, they're osteoclastic type. They sometimes have several nuclei, three, four, five nuclei. And then other times they may have numerous nuclei, 20 or 30, tons of nuclei, okay? And uh, they're scattered about in a background that contains many mononuclear histiocytoid cells. Now these, and you can see them right here, all of these histiocytoid cells in the background, these are actually the neoplastic tumor cells. These are the tumor cells and the giant cells just kind of get recruited in here and come hang out in the middle of the tumor. At least that's my understanding of it. The uh, actual biology may be more complicated than that, but that's my understanding. All right, so learning to recognize what these histiocytoid cells are in the background and what they look like, that's really one of the keys to recognizing tenosynovial giant cell tumors, okay? So those cells are, are gonna be in sheets and sometimes in little cords and they're going to be in a really sclerotic and hyalinized uh, background. And then the giant cells are gonna be scattered throughout. All right, let me go show you a handful of examples. This case actually was from the finger. And it's a circumscribed little nodule that's coming right off of the tendon, all right? So when you have a circumscribed nodule, um, and it's on the distal extremity usually, we call these the localized form of tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And again, the other name for that is giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. Most of the time they're small, they're circumscribed, um, and not infiltrative, and they're usually on the hands or the fingers. Occasionally they can be in other sites like the feet, and sometimes you can even have them in the larger joints like the knee, but again, they're gonna be small and circumscribed both to the surgeon and radiographically on imaging, and that's gonna help you make the diagnosis. Now, the more infiltrative types, um, PVNS, they usually are in the large joints. The knee is the most common site, but occasionally they can occur in other large joints, and I've even rarely seen the, the infiltrative or, or diffuse form in, um, in the foot. But again, uh, the distinction is mostly based on their size and their uh, clinical appearance. Uh, microscopically, they're very similar with a couple of exceptions, which we'll talk about in a minute. So here we've looked at giant cells embedded in this background of mononuclear cells, and that's one of the, the characteristic features of tenosynovial giant cell tumors. Here's another example. This one was also the localized form, or giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. This one's much more cellular than the case I just showed you. But you can see, even from low power, here we're on the 2x objective, you can see these large multinucleated giant cells scattered throughout. And they look just like they did in that other case but they're very infrequent in this uh, particular example. And you'll have sheets of, of mononuclear cells like this. If you just look at this, you might not at all think about tenosynovial giant cell tumor because you don't see the giant cells. So again, you have to learn to recognize it with, when the giant cells are absent. So this one is actually kind of spindled in some areas, but there's one feature right here that is a useful clue. 
These are foamy histiocytes, xanthomatous cells, right here. And foamy histiocytes are a really common finding and a very useful diagnostic clue in both in giant cell tumor of tendon sheath and in pigmented villa nodular synovitis. They tend to cluster around the periphery of the, the tumor nodules, but not always, and they're not always present, but when you find them, it can be very helpful, especially in cases like this, where the giant cells are kind of sparse. And why this is important is that frozen sections, sometimes you'll get sent one of these, and if the clinician, uh, the surgeon, if they're not suspecting a tenosynovial giant cell tumor, and if you as the pathologist aren't suspecting one, you might see a cellular kind of nodule like this, and if there are not very many giant cells around, you might get worried about malignancy. And a very important thing to remember is that um, tenosynovial giant cell tumors can have mitotic activity, sometimes very brisk, as high as even 10, 15, 20 mitoses even per 10 high power fields. In pretty much every other setting in, in neoplastic pathology, that many mitoses is very worrisome for malignancy. But these tumors are kind of a weird exception to the rule that they, even when they have robust mitotic activity, they still don't seem to behave any differently. There's no way to predict which ones are going to recur or not. Here we have the giant cells again and in the background, the mononuclear uh, cells. So when you see mononuclear histiocytoid cells and then you find some foam cells in the background, that's a really important clue for uh, tena synovial giant cell tumor. And you can see even from low power here, you can see these little pockets of foamy histiocytes. So find the foamy histiocytes, that's a great clue for the diagnosis. And you can see how beautifully circumscribed this particular example is very smoothly circumscribed around the outside and that's a good feature for the localized form of tenosynovial giant cell tumor, giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. Here's another example. And this one's a little bit pale, but you can see, look at how sclerotic it is. So one other finding that we see in tenosynovial giant cell tumors is the background collagen tends to be very dense and sclerotic, and sometimes it can even resemble osteoid a little bit. So uh, the finding the mononuclear cells embedded in this very sclerotic background is a really characteristic uh, feature here. I'm going to actually leave this a little bit out of focus and try to flip the condenser so that you can see and it highlights that refractile nature. You can see each little strand of very dense collagen and you can see how this kind of vaguely resembles osteoid deposition. Um, okay, again, notice these mononuclear histiocytoid cells that have kind of open chromatin usually, punctate nucleoli, and they usually have abundant cytoplasm and they're embedded in this background of very sclerotic collagen. Now, right here you can see something else, another feature that's helpful, and that's the presence of hemosiderin. Hemosiderin is usually present in um, both the localized and the diffuse forms of tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And that's why the diffuse form, when it involves a joint, is called pigmented villonodular synovitis because it looks darkly pigmented um, uh, during surgery and grossly because of the abundance of hemosiderin. So there are hemosiderin deposits. So that's another clue when you're seeing a sheet of histiocytoid cells on frozen sections, say, and you don't find any giant cells, but if you see foam cells, you see sclerotic background collagen, you see hemosiderin, all of those things are great great clues for a diagnosis of tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And the hemosiderin is usually uh, relatively abundant. There are some cases that lack it, but it's usually there. Now, here is one more finding that is, to me, when I see this, this essentially cinches the diagnosis. And I, it's because I don't know of anything else uh, that I can recall seeing in soft tissue pathology where you see this the hemosiderin has a tendency to be deposited in these large epithelioid histiocytic cells, the tumor cells of tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And when the hemosiderin gets in the, the cells, it tends to make this little wreath or halo. I think it's like a little halo, like on, a, on an angel, a little halo of hemosiderin around the outside of these big fat histiocytoid cells. That to me is so incredibly characteristic of giant cell tumor tendon sheath and pigment of villanodular synovitis. And they don't always have it, but when you find that and you're in this setting, I, I don't know that I've ever seen anything else and if you have please leave a comment down below and tell me um, if you've ever seen this pattern in something else I don't think that I've ever seen it in anything aside from um, these these two forms of tenosynovial giant cell tumor and note again in this field 
foamy histiocytes in the background. Really, really useful clue. So look for the hemosiderin halo. Some people call these ladybird cells, which I believe is like the British form of ladybug. In the United States, we call those ladybugs because the cells with their, when they have a little nucleus, it looks like the head and then the round body looks like the body of the ladybug. So um, I'm not sure if that works for you, but if it does, uh, go for it. See, here's another one right here. There's the, the histiocytoid cell. They have the eccentric nucleus. Their nucleus is usually pushed to the side, which really gives them, to my eye, kind of a plasmacytoid or even rhabdoid appearance. Look, here's another one over here. Big nucleus, and it's pushed to the side by all that grayish pink cytoplasm. Some of the histiocytoid cells will be really big, like the ones I just showed you, and others will be smaller. So you kind of can have both small and large histiocytic cells. And the other thing that these histiocytes like to do is they like to aggregate in these little clusters, and sometimes these clusters will get discohesive and make like open spaces that look like little pools with histiocytes swimming around in the middle. I'll show you some, um, I think, elsewhere on this slide. Let me see if I can find it. Here's a great example. In the midst of this sclerotic background, you can see there's a little pool of discohesive histiocytes and they're all kind of filling this space. You can see giant cells there, all the features we like for the tena synovial giant cell tumor. Now this is a great example. Um, this case right here shows really nice cystic change. And these cystic spaces, again, these are from those, those aggregates of histiocytes that kind of become discohesive and fall apart. And so the histiocytes fill the space and kind of float around in the middle. So I think I like to think of this as like a swimming pool in the middle of the summer with like a thousand little kids floating around in their little inner tubes in the middle of the pool. So that's the kind of visual that works for me. And this is a really characteristic feature of these tumors. And also, again, look at that really sclerotic, hyalinized background collagen that kind of resembles osteoid in some ways. So also very helpful. The giant cells, again, osteoclastic giant cells are present. And so that's another uh, helpful clue to the diagnosis. But uh, I urge all of my trainees, I want you to be able to recognize a tenus synovial giant cell tumor when there's zero giant cells present, because when you can do that, then that's really gonna save you in difficult cases. And here's what I mean by difficult cases. There are times that these will come up um, I've seen an example once before in a patient that had a history of cancer. They did a PET scan as screening and they found a hot PET nodule. Um, and when they biopsied it, they did a frozen section and it was an area with sheets of epithelioid cells with some mitotic activity. And the suspicion was that it was metastatic cancer. It was PET hot and the patient had cancer. Well, on the frozen, I didn't see any giant cells, but I did see some foam cells and I did see some hemosiderin and I thought this is probably a tenosynovial giant cell tumor. So I told them that's what I thought and we deferred at the permanent and sure enough when the complete specimen came out that's exactly what it was. These tumors um, are often pet avid because again they have a lot of mitotic activity usually so they will light up on pet scans. So in patients that have a known history of cancer and are getting pet scans if they have one of these tumors they may get incidentally discovered because of their avidity on the pet scan. So just know about that 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 they can be pet avid, they can be mitotically active, and if you don't see giant cells, and if you don't know these background um, uh, subtleties, you're gonna easily go down the tubes on a frozen section and call it um, a malignancy, potentially. And again, look at the eccentric, almost rhabdoid appearance of these um, histiocytes, and again, the little halo, the cute little halo of hemosiderin around the outside, the periphery of the cell. So yet another feature here, the discohesive pools, little swimming pools filled with histiocytes. If you like uh, that analogy, I think that's a really a nice analogy that works for me. Okay, Let's see if there's something else here. And here's an example where you really can see just how giant cell poor these can be. Look, we've got sheets of xanthomata cells and sheets of mononuclear histiocytes, but the giant cells are very sparse. They're like none in this field. just these big plump histiocytes. So again, recognizing the hemosiderin and the foam, uh, xanthomata cells can really make the difference and look at how big they can be. I mean, they can be quite large. 
And um, so I've talked to you about mitotic activity as being a possible thing. The other thing to know is that um, uh, these cells will usually stay with CD68, but it's not uncommon to have Desmond expression in a subset of the cells in tenosynovial giant cell tumors. And obviously with this kind of eccentric, almost rhabdoid shape and the fact that they can have mitoses, when you see that plus Desmond expression, it would be easy to um, get confused if you're not familiar with rhabdomyosarcomas, you might get confused and think that this could be a rhabdo. Now, I'm, I'm not, I can't really think of an example of rhabdomyosarcoma that I've seen that really histologically on H&E looked like a tenosynovial giant cell tumor, but for someone who's not very familiar with rhabdos, you see rhabdoid looking cells and you see Desmond, it would be easy to make that mistake. And again, in, th in this field, look, we've got mitotic activity in here. So you can see there's, it's hard to get them to come up on the screen, but there are two mitoses just in this one field. So the large cells, don't let that worry you. The mitoses, don't let that worry you. Now, uh, the giant cell tumor of tendon sheath form does recur occasionally, but when it recurs, it's local and non-destructive. The diffuse form, pigment of villanodular synovitis, which we're about to get to, it's more problematic. Even though it is technically benign and, and non-metastasizing, it can be locally aggressive, and it can really cause a lot of pain and morbidity for the patient, um, limiting the range of motion of their joint, and has a high tendency for recurrence. And so because of that, even though it's benign, it's a problematic tumor for patients to have. Okay, let's look at pigmented villanodular synovitis. Now these again are also known as um uh, tenosynovial giant cell tumor diffuse type, and when they involve the interarticular space, they tend to make these fronds that, that have a villous kind of look to them, um, and that's where they got the name pigment of villanodular synovitis. They're pigmented because of the hemosiderin, and they're villous because of this. See, these are frond-like papillary projections of the tumor out into the joint space, and it gives the joint a kind of, the, uh, the synovium a very shaggy, kind of lush appearance um, intraoperatively and grossly, and again, it's very pigmented because look at this. You can see even from low power, the hemosiderin that's embedded in these papillae. Now, it's important to not confuse papillary synovial hyperplasia, which we can see as a reactive finding in a wide variety of different inflammatory um, and degenerative joint processes. Don't confuse papillary hyperplasia with the true papillae that are being formed by tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And the way to avoid that confusion is look down into these papillae and what you will see is you're going to see those histiocytoid cells that we've been talking about that are characteristic of tenosynovial giant cell tumors. Here they are. They're histiocytes and they're loaded with hemosiderin. And some of them, if we look around, some of them will even have that halo appearance that is so very characteristic of uh, this entity. Let me find a good one. And here, they're so, they're, in fact, they have so much hemocytorin, you can barely see the halo because they're just loaded with it. So it's important, though, to recognize you really have to, you can't just see the, the frond-like uh, projections. You have to really see the tumor cells, the histiocytes, that help you make the diagnosis. All right, now let's get back to low power here. So that's the, the characteristic uh, papillary configuration. And you also get these kind of cleft-like, synovial-like uh, spaces um, that are kind of entrapped in here. And then uh, over on this side, you can really see here's skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. And here's the tumor invading out of the joint space and into the adjacent soft tissue. And that's why these tumors are the diffuse form because they're diffuse infiltrative growth. And this is why they tend to recur more often because it's hard to clear them. Even when you go and clean out the joint, it's often some left over and will potentially grow back and recur. So local recurrence is a big problem with these. And again, they can cause a lot of morbidity to the patient, okay? So this is a nice example of pigmented villanodular synovitis. Occasionally, you can have the diffuse form occur extra articularly outside of the joint. Um, and uh, we don't usually use the word PVNS in that setting because it doesn't have that villous architecture. But you can see um, uh, the diffuse form of tenous synovial giant cell tumor in the adjacent soft tissue. Okay, a couple more examples here. Again, this is the really nice uh, papillary architecture that you can see in PVNS. Look at all the foamy cells and little pockets of degenerative uh, cystic breakdown that you're seeing out here. Really characteristic findings. And the giant cells tend to be a bit more sparse, I think, in the diffuse form in pigmented villanodular synovitis uh, than in the giant cell tumor of tendon sheath form. Um, here's another example, 
and so the fronds aren't always quite as obvious as the other as the other um, cases I showed, but you can still see these cleft-like spaces in between, and those spaces in the outer surface of the papillae are lined by synovium. So synovium is kind of a weird thing. It, to me, I don't know how to really explain synovium well. I think it's like if, if a bunch of histiocytes got together and kind of made a half-hearted attempt at making an epithelial layer, that's what synovium is. I don't know if that visually works for you, but I feel like it looks like it should be epithelium, but it doesn't hold or cling together quite as well as a true multi-layered epithelium will. So that's why I kind of think that, and synoviocytes to me look a lot like histiocytes and I think are probably um, related embryologically. Um, at least uh, that's, that's my best understanding of it. So the synovial lining out here is really helpful. These cleft-like spaces uh, lined by synovium, very helpful for the diffuse form. And again, look, no giant cells here, okay? Foam cells, mononuclear histiocytes, hemocytorin. Oh wait, there's one giant cell. Okay, maybe one. But they're very sparse and you have to recognize all the other features to get the diagnosis. Uh, here's one other example showing a really nice, dense, osteoid-like um, collagen in the background in between the cells. And this one has some giant cells embedded in there and the mononuclear cells. But recognizing that osteoid-like um, background is really helpful. Get a little closer here to see it. So I think that pretty much sums up um, the findings that we see in tenosynovial giant cell tumors. And I'm gonna just leave you with one last really amazing image of the halos of hemocytorin. Look at that. They're just crazy. So they don't always look this good, but it's really, to me, the most important feature of this tumor is uh, all the background features are helpful, but really recognizing these big, plump, almost rhabdoid looking histiocytes and recognizing their little halos of hemocytorin, that's the key to being comfortable with arriving at this diagnosis, um, even when giant cells are not present because they're just such a characteristic appearance and it's really helpful to recognize. Sometimes the halo doesn't go all the way around, it's just part ways. Um, but you can see this particular example has tons of them. And each little cell is, is, or each of these big cells is surrounded by that ring of hemocytorin. And again, look, the nuclei are big. They have nucleoli, there's a bunch of cytoplasm. So when you have that coupled with the mitotic activity, it can really freak you out if you're, if you're not totally comfortable. So it's just like in all of pathology, don't just focus on the one single diagnostic feature, pay attention to all the details in the background, and that'll help you when the key finding that you normally find is not there. When the giant cells are missing, you'll still be able to look at this and say, oh, there's a mitosis, no problem. Oh, there's some big plump cells, no problem. This thing is still a tenosynovial giant cell tumor. I'm totally comfortable with that because you recognize all of these other features that go into making the diagnosis. So I hope this video helped. Um, uh, if so, please click like and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. And uh, feel free to leave comments in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching.